Salam from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. You're watching Daily Debrief, the show where we bring you some of the real stories behind the biggest news headlines in the world. I'm Siddhant Dani, and we are coming to you from New Delhi. On the show today, we're talking about why the WHO, that's the World Health Organization, is increasingly alarmed about recent outbreaks of cholera around the world and the underlying factors that lead to these outbreaks. Ahead of COP27 in Egypt, we look once again at the political persecution of pro-democracy voices in the country, including Ala Abdel Fattah, who spent over 200 days on hunger strike while in jail. And three years on from a popular uprising that promised to change the road Chile was marching down since the Augusto Pinochet dictatorship, a report on how changes are taking place in the country and what the future holds for Chile. First up, nobody should be dying of cholera in 2022. That's the opinion of the World Health Organization as news comes in of the latest outbreak of a disease that, though easily treatable, still kills close to 150,000 people around the world every year, mostly in the world's poorest and most conflict-ridden nations. Several countries, including Haiti, Nigeria, Malawi, Ethiopia and Syria, have been fighting outbreaks in recent weeks and months. Lebanon has now joined the list, according to its health minister, Firas Abed, who told reporters that uh, cases were seen last Wednesday. It's the first outbreak of the disease in the country since back in 1993 and follows on the back of three years of dire economic conditions and a porous border with war-torn Syria. Over a million Syrian refugees are in Lebanon, living cloistered in camps where conditions like no sewage or running water make it perfect for the spread of cholera. Anna Brachar of the People's Health Movement joins us for an update on the situation around the world as well as the future impact of the discontinuation of Sanofi's cholera vaccine, one of only two usable in emergency conditions. Anna, welcome back to Daily Debrief. Uh, first up, uh, we're getting reports from various countries across the world of cholera outbreaks. Could you sort of uh, give us a bit of a roundup of what's going on in various countries across multiple continents at this point? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, essentially the last country to announce a cholera outbreak was Lebanon, uh, just at the beginning of October. And since then, since October 5th, uh, when, when the outbreak was uh, was announced, announced uh, there were 169 cases recorded, and these include five deaths. So it's important to note that this is the first outbreak of cholera in, in Lebanon since 1993. Uh, and uh, also an important detail is that the health ministry of Lebanon has said that um, half of the 169 cases were recorded in only a couple of days, so in the last uh, two or three days. Mm. So, uh, you know, of course, the, the outbreak uh, started uh, not surprisingly uh, among uh, in refugee camps where people from, from Syria live. Uh, and I'm saying that this is not surprising because cholera is very related to the living conditions in which people find themselves in. Uh, and of course, migrant camps uh, uh, provide very poor living conditions to people without any access or poor access to water, to food uh, and to sanitation. And so um, a couple of days or uh, a week or so, better to say, after, uh, after the, the announced outbreak, the WHO published a situation report on what was happening in Lebanon, looking into you know, who was mostly affected uh, and uh, what was there to be done. Uh, and at that point on October 13th, uh, they noted that uh, the most affected group were children under the age of five. Uh, and that uh, also women were being disproportionately affected by, by the outbreak. So uh, once again, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a disease that's having a disproportionately large impact on groups who already re uh, suffer because of reduced access to care and uh, groups who need actually mm, more protection that they already have. Mo moving on to the second part of our conversation today, we're also looking at, at the same time, uh, Sanofi's Indian uh, subsidiary, Shanta Biotechnics, announcing that it will finally discontinue uh, production of its vaccine, which is, I believe, uh, one of uh, the vaccines that is one of two vaccines that is approved because it's usable. As you're able to store it for two weeks, up to 40 degrees centigrade. And therefore, in these kind of emergency situations, it becomes all the more useful. Uh, what kind of impact is this likely to have on the global cholera situation? 
Well, for one thing, the WHO is very concerned about the situation uh, overall with cholera vaccines. And essentially, um, you know, in, in a matter of days since, uh, since the announcement came from the Sanofi uh, subsidiary, uh, the WHO has actually issued uh, advice to change the regiment of, uh, of the cholera vaccine. So to reduce uh, from, the, uh, from the original two doses to one dose, because they're very worried about the, the amount of vaccine that exists in the world. World. It's also, you know, uh, the worry is also very connected uh, to what you mentioned before, and that's uh, the number of outbreaks that they're recording in the world. So uh, only uh, in 2022, uh, 29 countries have reported a cholera outbreak. Uh, in comparison, in the previous five years, so they, this is WHO data, uh, there were fewer than 20 countries who reported uh, who reported outbreaks. And so now, you know, they're seeing cases rise in, uh, or they're just seeing cases in Malawi, in Nigeria, in Haiti, uh, in Ethiopia as well. You know, there, there has been an outbreak in Pakistan. And so what the WHO is saying uh, to control cholera, of course, it's important to act on the living conditions. So if we don't act on those, the vaccines will not will not help people. But in the meantime, it's important to have the vaccines. So at least it gives countries the time to prepare. And what uh, the, WHO, uh, the WHO Director General has repeated over and over again is that uh, the manufacturers of the existing vaccines should actually look at ways to increase production rather than stop it. So mm. in this context, the announcement was, uh, you know, it, it came, uh, it came quite, 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 as a sh quite as a shock, uh, if we can call it that. Um, and of course, it doesn't help the overall situation where, for example, and, and again, this is uh, coming from the WHO, uh, for this year, they had planned about uh, 36 million doses of cholera vaccine to be distributed around the world. So, uh, and 24 million of these have already been shipped around. So the majority of these uh, is to respond to, um, to situations that are ongoing on the ground. So it's not preventive. Uh, over 80% of those, uh, ha uh, so over 80% of the vaccine doses that have been shipped around uh, have been shipped around to to address outbreaks. Right. Uh, so in this in this context, uh, you know, news that people who the manufacturers that can produce vaccines are uh, actually actively stopping to do that is very worrying and it, mm, it leaves open the question what what's going to happen if uh, if this kind of uh, uh, outbreak the amount of outbreaks that we're seeing continues all right thanks very much anna for that update after over 200 days on hunger strike in egypt's wadi al natrun prison british egyptian activist allah abdul fatah is reportedly on death's door his sister Sana Saif is currently on a sit-in outside the UK Foreign Office, demanding that the Liz Trust-led government, while in Egypt for the COP27 climate meet, finds a political resolution to Abdul Fattah's case, and also to highlight the widespread political persecution of all kinds of pro-democracy opposition voices by the LCC regime. I spoke earlier to Dr. Abdul Rahman, who covers the region for People's Dispatch. Good to see you again on Daily Debrief, Abdul. Uh, the case of uh, Allah Abdul Fatah is one that we have covered before, of course, on Daily Debrief. Uh, but just start by giving us a reminder of why uh, the activist is currently in Egyptian prison. Uh, at this moment, he's in prison because in 2000, uh, last year, basically, though he was arrested in 2019. In, uh, in December 2021, he was convicted uh, quote unquote, uh, for uh, spreading false news and uh, for five years. So he's in jail because of that uh, particular reason. But uh, of course, one should not see uh, that as the main reason. The main reason behind his uh, being in prison is the uh, Abdul uh, uh, Fatah al-Sisi's uh, regime, which has been very harsh, very uh, uh, strict when it comes to the opposition uh, Polit opposition, opposition politicians, and particularly people whom, who basically fought for human right and democratization in, in the country. Mm. So Allah, uh, uh, Allah Abdul Fattah being one of the main faces of uh, pro-democracy, human right uh, uh, movement in the country, has been uh, uh, facing the, uh, uh, the persecution 
in Egypt for uh, more than a decade now, almost. And he has been in jails from various times, uh, uh, serving uh, sometimes convicted, sometimes without conviction. Uh, his family has been targeted again and again. Her, uh, his sister, for example, has, had been in prison three times uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, his reason behind his uh, 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 imprisonment at this moment is primarily the uh, authoritarian uh, uh, rule in Egypt, uh, which does not uh, see any, uh, see any pro-democratic forces as threat to its uh, existence. Right. We know, Abdul, that in a few days from now, uh, world leaders will descend on uh, Egypt, Cairo, the capital, for COP27, uh, the climate uh, talks. In, th in that context, we, this is an opportunity to bring up not just Abdul Fattah's case, but also the case of tens of thousands of political prisoners who are currently incarcerated in Egypt. Uh, what is the general situation with regards to uh, political persecution and, and uh, well, human rights and the freedom of expression in that sense. Uh, if you if you go by different reports by different human rights organizations, more than sixty thousand uh, uh, political prisoners are there in Egypt. Is Egypt being a small country, relatively small country, when you compare with countries like India, this is a huge number. Al Al Fatah's uh, uh, imprisonment is one part of it. It's a very small uh, one in individual incident. Uh, but uh, it, is, it basically reflects to the larger uh, political operation which is uh, uh, faced by the human rights activists, pro-democracy uh, activists in Egypt. Since the 2013 coup, uh, uh, we should not forget that in 2011, there was a pro-democracy a popular uprising, which finally led to the uh, displacement of a long-term authoritarian uh, ruler, Husni Mubarak. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a very brief period, there, that it, it felt that there, there is going to be a democratic uh, change in Egypt. But within a few months, uh, uh, army came back to power. And then since then, uh, um, uh, Al-Sisi has been in power. So Al-Sisi's uh, regime in Egypt has uh, uh, basically led to uh, the suppression of all kind of political uh, dissent. Uh, it, it led to banning most of the political parties in the country. Uh, uh, not even for a very long time, the workers were not allowed to uh, go on a strike as well. Only last year when the LCC finally decided that emergency uh, uh, laws are not needed, mm. after a decade, they were lifted. So uh, still, uh, there are laws which basically restrict all kinds of political uh, movements and uh, mobilization. So uh, uh, in Egypt, human right and freedom of expression and uh, speech and expression is under threat. That is a quite uh, uh, well-known fact. Right. Uh, among, among all, uh, so uh, sorry, Al Al uh, uh, imprisonment should also be seen in the context of his uh, 200 days uh, long uh, hunger strike. Mm. That hunger strike uh, basically is an attempt to make this particular political situation in Egypt, which we are talking about, make uh, global, to let the other people know, and particularly in the context of the climate summit, which you are referring to, when the leaders from across the world will gather in, uh, in Egypt, this is uh, uh, Al Fatah and his family is trying to make it an issue. So it, mm. one should not see it as an issue uh, related to one individual. It right. is also about the larger political persecution uh, 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 in the country. All right. Thanks very much, Abdul, for that update. And finally, October 18th, 2022 marked three years since the beginning of the uprising in Chile for social and economic rights and against neoliberalism. This uprising brought many long-standing issues to the table, such as the demand to change the country's current constitution. This was, of course, written and imposed in, the 19, in 1980 under the US-backed military civic dictatorship of General Augusto Pinochet. On the anniversary, thousands took to the street to mark the day and recall that the popular demand still exists for a new and inclusive con a constitution, and that demand remains unfulfilled. Zoe Alexandra of People's Dispatch covers the region for us, and she has more details. Zoe, welcome back to Daily Debrief. Uh, first up, three years, uh, the three-year anniversary of the, the social movement that sort of changed the direction in which Chile was heading. Uh, 
Uh, how was the occasion marked and, and what were sort of the calls from the people who mobilized that day? Yes, well, on October 18th in 2019 was the beginning of what became a huge so social uprising in Chile against neoliberalism, against the exclusion of the majorities from politics, from economic life, from social life. And this was commemorated with a large mobilization in the capital and other cities across Chile. Um, it's really, a, it was a really momentous um, uprising in 2019. It did take place right before the COVID-19 pandemic. So a lot of this is kind of lost in the oblivion, but um, in the moment and, you know, it did, as you said, it really marked the path forward for Chile and in really where Chile is today is based is because of this uprising. Um, one of the major demands that was raised during this social uprising, which took place over several months and saw millions of people taking to the streets, um, was for the constitution to be changed in the country. Uh, as we've reported at People's Dispatch, uh, the current constitution, which is continues till today, was written um, during the military, civic military dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet, um, who took power through a military coup against um, socialist leader Salvador Allende. And so this constitution, in addition to, be to being written during the military dictatorship, has really cemented a lot of the inequalities cemented a lot of the exclusion of the masses from political participation, um, from guaranteeing their basic social and economic rights. And so it really became a driving force behind the mobilizations for people to uh, to bring people out on the streets. And they had kind of this uniting call to change the constitution, for there to be a process uh, created for people to participate in the writing of this new constitution. And this, in fact, was achieved even under the presidency of conservative former president Sebastián Piñera. They started the process of calling for a referendum to see if the people did want to rewrite the constitution. Uh, this was approved. They created the constitutional convention. They voted the members of this constitutional convention. The people of Chile selected the people who would be writing this constitution. This uh, constitutional convention worked for a year and very recently they presented their draft of what would be the new constitution for Chile. But as we know, this draft was not approved. And so in these uh, mobilizations on the three years since the social uprising began, one of the main demands is that there be a new constitution and that this demands not be lost. Um, that just because it wasn't approved in the referendum, that the people still need a new constitution and that all of the demands they raise continue to be ever more relevant, even though there is a progressive government of Gabriel Boric, and even though there have been some advances, there's still many more things to go. So where do we go exactly from here, uh, Zoe? What next, uh, both on the political front, uh, in terms of Boric and, and the, the progressive government that he's leading, uh, and of course, specifically with regards to the constitution, and, I mean, we did, we reported also when the convention concluded and when they presented their draft of uh, one of the most inclusive sort of uh, books of law uh, ever written, probably. Uh, how, how, how do the people want to proceed from here and, and where do you see the real politics on the ground taking it? Well, it was a big defeat um, for progressive sections in Chile, but also for the presidency of Gabriel Boric. For many people, they saw it as kind of a referendum of his presidency. And following the defeat of the um, draft of the constitution, he reshuffled the cabinet he took out a lot of progressives that were in his government and, you know, swapped them for more centrist, more pragmatic um, politicians and, and people. And so we're seeing a bit of a shift towards the center, a bit of a kind of reconciliation with sectors that he was really going up against. I think it's interesting um, seeing his speech on this day of the three year anniversary. Gabriel Boric made a speech to Chile, the people of Chile, and he said um, that it was that this uprising was not a anti-capitalist revolution. But I think if you asked most people who were on the streets in 2019, it was precisely that. It was a mobilization against capitalism, against neoliberalism, against the exclusion of the masses. And so I think it's gonna take a lot of uh, organization of the people, a lot of uh, challenging of the government um, in order to create these, uh, to push for these demands, but it is an uphill battle. They're on the back foot with the um, rejection of the constitutional draft. However, uh, they're going to redraft the constitution, create another proposal, which will also be brought to the people. So the struggle is not over, but it's definitely 
um, an uphill battle right now. Um, and it, because of the uh, referendum that was passed to create the Constitutional Convention, it says that the process, even though the, the draft was rejected, that it still continues and not, it's not like it just goes back to the old constitution and right. they won't have to, um, you know, uh, they won't just have to live with that constitution. They'll, they're will they going to create a new one um, and and that is gonna be part of the path forward. All right, very much for that update, Zoe. That's a wrap for this episode of Daily Debrief. We'll of course be back same time, same place tomorrow. Uh, until then, for more details on these stories and all of the other work we do, as always, we request you to head over to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and don't forget to give us a follow on the social media platform of your choice. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.